Part One, Chapter Twenty of the Fur Country. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fur Country by Jules Verne, Part One, Chapter Twenty. Mercury freezes. A few days of dry, calm weather favored the operations of the hunters, but they did not venture far from the fort. The abundance of game rendered it unnecessary to do so, and Lieutenant Hobson could justly congratulate himself on having chosen so favorable a situation for the new settlement. A great number of furred animals of all kinds were taken in the traps, and Sabine and Marbra killed a good many polar hares. Some twenty starving wolves were shot. Hunger rendered the latter animals aggressive, and bands of them gathered about the fort, filling the air with hoarse howls. And amongst the hummocks on the ice fields, sometimes prowled huge bears, whose movements were watched with great interest. On the twenty-fifth December, all excursions had again to be given up. The wind veered suddenly to the north. And the cold became exceedingly severe. It was impossible to remain out of doors without being frostbitten. The Fahrenheit thermometer fell to eighteen degrees below zero, and the gale roared like a volley of musketry. Hobson took care to provide the animals with food enough to last several weeks. Christmas Day, the day of home gatherings, so dear to the heart of all Englishmen, was kept with due solemnity. The colonists returned thanks to God for preserving them through so many perils, and the workmen who had a holiday in honor of the day afterwards assembled with their masters and the ladies round a well-filled board on which figured two huge Christmas puddings. In the evening, a huge bowl of punch flamed in the centre of the table. The lamps were put out, and for a time the room was lighted only by the livid flames of the spirit. The familiar objects assuming strange, fantastic forms. The spirits of the soldiers rose as they watched the flickering illumination, and their excitement was not lessened after imbibing some of the burning liquid. But now the flames began to pale. Bluish tongues still fitfully licked the plump sides of the national pudding for a few minutes, and then died away. Strange to say, although the lamps had not been relit. The room did not become dark on the extinction of the flames. A bright light was streaming through the window, which had passed unnoticed in the previous illumination. The revellers started to their feet and looked at each other in astonishment. "A fire!" cried several. But unless the house itself were burning, there could not be a fire anywhere near Cape Bathurst. The lieutenant rushed to the window. And at once understood the cause of the phenomenon. It was an eruption. Indeed, above the western cliffs beyond Walruses Bay, the horizon was on fire. The summits of the igneous hills, some miles from Cape Bathurst, could not be seen, but the sheaf of flame shot up to a considerable height, lighting up the whole country in a weird, unearthly manner. It is more beautiful than the aurora borealis! Exclaimed Mrs. Barnett. Thomas Black indignantly protested against this assertion. A terrestrial phenomenon more beautiful than a meteor, but no one was disposed to argue with him about it. For all hurried out, in spite of the bitter gale and biting cold, to watch the glorious spectacle of the flashing sheaf of flames standing out against the black background of the night sky. Had not the mouths and ears of the party been cased in furs? They would have been able to hear the rumbling noise of the eruption, and to tell each other of the impressions made upon them by this magnificent sight. But as it was, they could neither speak nor hear. They might be well content, however, with gazing upon such a glorious scene—a scene which once looked upon could never be forgotten. The glowing sheets of flames contrasted alike with the gloomy darkness of the heavens. And the dazzling whiteness of the far-stretching carpet of snow, and produced effects of light and shade which no pen or pencil could adequately portray. The throbbing reverberations spread beyond the zenith, gradually quenching the light of all the stars. 
the white ground became dashed with golden tints. The hummocks on the ice field and the huge icebergs in the background reflecting the glimmering colors like so many glowing mirrors. The rays of light striking on the edges or surfaces of the ice became bent and diffracted, the angles and varying inclinations on which they fell fretting them into fringes of color and reflecting them back with changed and heightened beauty. It was like a fairy scene in which ice and snow combined to add eclat to a melee of rays in which luminous waves rushed upon each other, breaking into colored ripples. But the excessive cold soon drove the admiring spectators back to their warm dwelling, and many a nose paid dearly for the feast enjoyed by the eyes. During the following days the cold became doubly severe. The mercurial thermometer was of course no longer of any use for marking degrees, and an alcohol thermometer had to be used. On the night of the 28th to the 29th December, the column fell to 32 degrees below zero. The stoves were piled up with fuel, but the temperature in the house could not be maintained above 20 degrees. The bedrooms were exceedingly cold, and ten feet from the stove in the large room, its heat could not be felt at all. The little baby had the warmest corner, and its cradle was rocked in turn by those who came to the fire. Opening doors or windows was strictly forbidden, as the vapor in the rooms would immediately have been converted to snow, and in the passage the breathing of the inmates already produced that result. Every now and then dull reports were heard, which startled those unaccustomed to living in such high latitudes. They were caused by the cracking of the trunks of trees, of which the walls were composed, under the influence of the intense cold. The stock of rum and gin, stowed away in the garret, had to be brought down into the sitting-room, as the alcohol was freezing and sinking to the bottom of the bottles. The spruce beer, made from a decoction of young fir branchlets, burst the barrels in which it was kept as it froze, whilst all the solid bodies resisted the introduction of heat, as if they were petrified. Wood burnt very slowly, and Hobson was obliged to sacrifice some of the walrus oil to quicken its combustion. Fortunately, the chimneys drew well, so that there was no disagreeable smell inside, although for a long distance outside the air was impregnated with the fetid odor of the smoke from Fort Hope, which a casual observer might therefore have pronounced an unhealthy building. One symptom we must notice was the great thirst from which every one suffered. To relieve it, different liquids had to be melted at the fire, for it would have been dangerous to eat ice. Another effect of the cold was intense drowsiness, which Hobson earnestly entreated his companions to resist. Some appeared unable to do so, but Mrs. Barnett was invaluable in setting an example of constant activity. Always brave, she kept herself awake, and encouraged others by her kindness, brightness, and sympathy. Sometimes she read aloud accounts of travels, or sang some old familiar English song, in the chorus of which all joined. These joyous strains roused up the sleepers, whether they would or no, and their voices soon swelled with the chorus. The long days of imprisonment passed wearily by, and the lieutenant, consulting the outside thermometer through the windows, announced that the cold was still on the increase. On the 31st December, the mercury was all frozen hard in the cistern of the instrument, so that the temperature was 44 degrees below freezing point. The next day, 1st January, 1860, Lieutenant Hobson wished Mrs. Barnett a happy new year, and complimented her on the courage and good temper with which she endured the miseries of this northern winter. The astronomer was not forgotten in the universal interchange of good wishes amongst the members of the little colony, but his only thought on entering another year was that it was the beginning of that in which the great eclipse was to take place. Fortunately, the general health still remained good, and any symptoms of scurvy were promptly checked by the use of lime juice and lime lozenges. It would not do, however, to rejoice too soon, 
The winter had still to last three months. The sun would doubtless reappear above the horizon in due time, but there was no reason to think that the cold had reached its maximum intensity. Especially as in most northern countries, February is the month during which the temperature falls lowest. However that might be, there is no decrease in the severity of weather during the first days of the new year, and on the 8th January the alcohol thermometer placed outside the window of the passage marked 66 degrees below zero. A few degrees more, and the minimum temperature at Fort Reliance in 1835 would be reached. Jasper Hobson grew more and more uneasy at the continued severity of the cold. He began to fear that the furred animals would have to seek a less rigorous climate further south, which would, of course, thwart all his plans for hunting in the early spring. Moreover, he sometimes heard subterranean rumblings, which were evidently connected with the volcanic eruption. The western horizon still glowed with the reflection of the burning lava, and it was evident that some great convulsion was going on in the bowels of the earth. Might not the close vicinity of an active volcano be dangerous to the new fort? Such was the question which the subterranean rumblings forced upon the mind of the lieutenant, but he kept his vague apprehensions to himself. Of course, under these circumstances, no one dreamt of leaving the house. The animals were well provided for, and being accustomed to long fasts in the winter, required no attention from their masters, so that there were really no necessity for any exposure out of doors. It was difficult enough to endure the inside temperature, even with the help of a plentiful combustion of wood and oil. For, in spite of every precaution, damp crept into the ill-ventilated rooms, and layers of ice, increasing in thickness every day, were formed upon the beams. The condensers were choked up, and one of them burst from the pressure of the ice. Lieutenant Thompson did not spare his fuel. He was, in fact, rather lavish of it in his anxiety to raise the temperature, which, when the fires got low, as of course sometimes happened, fell to fifteen degrees Fahrenheit. The men on guard, who relieved each other every hour, had strict orders to keep up the fires, and great was the dismay of the lieutenant when Sergeant Long said to him one day, "'We shall be out of wood soon.' "'Out of wood?' exclaimed Hobson. "'I mean, our stock is getting low, and we must lay in fresh stores soon.' "'Of course I know, though, that it will be at the risk of his life that anyone goes out in this cold.' "'Yes,' Hobson replied. "'It was a mistake not to build the wooden shed close to the house, and to make no direct communication with it. I see that now it is too late. I ought not to have forgotten that we were going to winter beyond the seventieth parallel. But what's done can't be undone. How long will the wood last? There is enough to feed the furnace and stove for another two or three days, replied the sergeant. Let us hope that by that time the severity of the cold may have decreased, and that we may venture across the court of the fort without danger. I doubt it, sir, replied Long, shaking his head. The atmosphere is very clear. The wind is still in the north, and I shall not be surprised if this temperature is maintained for another fifteen days, until the new moon, in fact. Well, my brave fellow, said the lieutenant, we won't die of cold if we can help it, and the day we have to brave the outside air. We will brave it, sir, said Long. Hobson pressed his subordinate's hand, well knowing the poor fellow's devotion. We might fancy that Hobson and the sergeant were exaggerating when they alluded to the fatal results from sudden exposure to the open air, but they spoke from experience, gained from long residence in the rigorous polar regions. They had seen strong men fall fainting on the ice under similar circumstances. Their breath failed them, and they were taken up in a state of suffocation. Incredible as such facts may appear, they have been of frequent occurrence amongst those who have wintered in the extreme north. In their journey along the shores of Hudson's Bay, in 1746, Moore and Smith saw many incidents of this kind. Some of their companions were killed, struck down by the cold. 
and there can be no doubt that sudden death may result from braving a temperature in which mercury freezes. Such was the distressing state of things at Fort Hope, when a new danger arose to aggravate the sufferings of the colonists. End of chapter 20